week, and next week we'll continue with the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. We're reading now what we call the parable of the talents, beginning at verse 14. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is, this, it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You are trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward also, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from, the one, from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is, again, a hard word from the Lord, but for that we give thanks to God. Amen. Those of you who are here, raise your hand if you're talented. One brave soul. Oh, I got another one, a couple back there. That's a good thing. The way we use the word talent in modern day English is that it means, this is the defini definition from the dictionary, born with an exceptional natural aptitude or skill in a particular area. You can think about music. We got to hear Elaine and Sylvia this morning providing us with a music ministry. And none of us here would say anything other than how talented they are. Art. Look up here at the display that Linda put up for us to remind us of the season of harvest and thanksgiving. Beautiful. And I've never been in a church before where I needed a painting done, and I'd call Toby and say, Toby, can you do a painting for me? And she says, yes, of course I can. If you remember the beautiful bulletin designs we've had at Christmas Eve and last year, one specifically for Charlie Brown's Christmas tree that she did for me. We have woodworkers here who do beautiful, exquisite work. And there are some people who are good with math. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because we put them on the finance committee, don't we? And then there are people who are just born teachers. Have you ever met anyone who just knew how to teach, maybe not without a college degree, but could just sit down and explain something in such a way that others came along and understood? And I believe that some of my colleagues were born with a preaching gene. I was not. But my friend, I'm going to mention him by name this morning, I'm going to tell him I called him out in worship. The Reverend Dr. Benjamin Kevin Smalls preached a sermon when he was 18 years old at Youth Assembly that I still remember all these years later. He is now the pastor of one of the largest churches in Michigan. And our bishop, I think, was born with that preaching gene as well. Some people love to cook and are very talented at cooking. And if you look around you today, you will see that Epworth is a very talented congregation. Would you say amen to that? Now, some of you are afraid to say anything to that because the nominations committee is at work right now. And I could preach a sermon on service. I could twist your arm a little, give you a little bit of guilt here and there, and say your church needs you and your talents. But biblically speaking, that is not the kind of talent Jesus was talking about. Whew, right? How many of you are relieved? Talent in the parable that we just read is a financial sum. 
not a coin or a paper bill the way we understand money, but it is a unit of weight. And this was a significant financial sum. We have a very talented congregation here, don't we? I'm not getting an amen to that. We do, because financial stewardship here has been incredible. A year ago, we were so far behind that this year we passed for 2020 a $70,000 deficit budget. By the end of the year, we expect to be on target for our giving and our expenses so that we will not have a deficit this year. And we are among the wealthiest people in the world. You know how I know that? Because other than every now and then when families run into a little bit of trouble in the congregation for the most part, how many of you had the ability to eat breakfast this morning even if you chose not to eat breakfast? How many of you were inside a house last night? How many of you had heat or at least a blanket to keep you warm? Even the times when my husband's medical debt climbed up over $30,000, we were still among the wealthiest people on earth because we had what we needed to survive. So I could really get the guilt going now, couldn't I? We could be preaching financial stewardship like we did in October, we preached the stewardship of life. So we could say your church needs you, so put your talents right back there into the offering box or go online and tithe your talent through Vanco. But guess what? Biblically speaking, this is not what this parable is about. So everybody relax, but not too much. Because what Jesus is really saying cuts closer to the bone for each of us, not just you sitting out there. These are the sermons. I told you I don't like to preach this parable. I don't like to preach this chapter of Matthew because it cuts close to my heart as well. Now, the modern word that we use for talent being that natural giftedness or ability, that comes from this passage. Actually, that's the, the etymology of that word, talent. In the 13th century, it was changed over to mean what we know it to mean today. But what we're going to look at today is what it really means. And to do that, we have to look at the finances of the story to understand that this story makes absolutely no sense. How does it begin? There was a wealthy man, a very wealthy man, and he had what? When, before he went on his trip, he summoned who? His slaves, not his children, not his finance manager, not his treasurer, not the people who worked for him or who related to him, the people that he owned, his slaves. He summoned them and he entrusted his money to them. What is wrong with that picture? He's away for an extended period of time. I don't know about you, but if I were enslaved and somebody left me in charge of the whole bank account, I think I would take a little bit of that and take off for the hills. Wouldn't you? Nobody ever volunteers to be a slave. They don't say, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me, do they? People who are enslaved either owe a great deal of money or they've been captured and taken from their homes. No one becomes a slave by choice. But what's weird is that he entrusts these people with his wealth, and not just a little wealth, because this is where you've got to do the math, and Jesus' math is kind of wonky in some places, particularly here, because the talents... The amount of money, that weight, either in silver or gold, one talent, the smallest gift that the master left for the servant that he called wicked and lazy when he returned, was worth about 20 years of wages for a worker. So do the math from there. What would five talents be equal to? 100 years of paychecks. Jerry, can you do that math for us now in your head? No, whopping big amount of money. The story makes no sense whatsoever because nobody would entrust that to a slave. And one just naturally goes out and doubles his money and the other doubles his money, but one buried it in the ground. And that's the one we tend to focus on in the story. The one who is thrown out where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth into the darkness, the door's closed, just like the door was closed last week to those women whose lamps ran out of oil. A hard word coming from Jesus, isn't it? So what is he really saying here? Is he talking about money? No. 
He's not talking about offerings that people could make to the temple with that kind of return on investment. He's talking about what is invested in us as disciples of Jesus Christ. What is invested in us but God's grace, God's mercy, God's word, God's peace, God's abundance that is given to us without reservation. Even though we are slaves to the word, we can say slaves to the Lord, that's not even what God is calling us now. God is just saying that we, on our own abilities, don't have much. But God is willing to give us everything through Jesus Christ, absolutely everything. We are stewards of these gifts. They are entrusted to us, salvation and mercy and peace. We have to ask ourselves then, why was that one who was entrusted with so very much more than he could ever hope to earn, and he wasn't earning money in this situation. He was enslaved. But what was entrusted to him was 20 years' worth of wages. That's a lot to be entrusted with to bury in the ground. He buried in the ground because he was afraid of his master. So what are we burying in the ground? And I'm not talking about your ability to play the piano or to do math or to serve in the church. And I'm not talking about the offering plate or the Vanco online giving or the boxes in the back of the church. I'm talking about what has God given you and that you are afraid to use. What has God given you that you're afraid to use? I can tell you for a pastor, we fear what people will say if we preach something that steps on too many toes. My superintendent called me a few months ago and asked that I would speak to the district about racism because one of my African-American colleagues had asked her if she would ask me if I would be willing to do that. And I talked to my colleagues who said, we don't want to talk about it because people will stop coming to church and they'll stop giving money. Or one pastor said to me, I am not an elder. I'm not guaranteed an appointment. They will get rid of me so fast my head will spin. And then yesterday on Facebook, the march in Washington, and I'm not, I'm not condemning people who went because most of the people who went were peaceful people. A lot of them were there to pray. But one of my dearest friends who is African American posted a picture from the rally with a sign that said, we're coming for the blacks first. I'm not afraid to tell you that that kind of racism is sin. But that's not what most of us are doing here, is it? I'm not saying that we're racists. I'm not saying that you're racist. I'm not saying that I'm a racist, although we have a responsibility to take a stand against racism. But we fear other things as well. We fear talking about our faith because somebody's going to either think that we are holier than thou or a holy roller. Don't be a pastor and go to a wedding reception where you don't know a lot of people because they'll put you at the religious crazy table. I tell you that right now. You get put with the people, the cousins, and the people who are only going to talk religion in just wacky ways. I remember going to a wedding reception, sitting there. The man next to me said, you know you're going to hell, don't you? I said, no, thank you. I said, why is that? He said, because you're not married. Women are only sanctified through their husbands. It was before I was married. And I just sat there, and someone else came up to me later and said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, but I knew you'd be nice to him, and nobody else could be nice to him. How did you get through that? I said, I just cut my baked potato. I was picturing his head, to be honest. Not a good response, but that's how I got through. We're afraid people will look at us like we're crazy if we share with them the depth of what God has given us in Jesus Christ. We're afraid to forgive others because we're afraid they'll hurt us again. We hold grudges. We judge, and we are hard on each other. We are so critical of each other sometimes, even in the church. That's the way we bury what God has given us in the ground. Sometimes we're just so afraid if we don't do everything right that God isn't going to love us. We're going to be that servant in the outer darkness. But that's where you read this understanding who Christ is talking to and what Christ is talking about. We get some insight into that from Paul's letter to the Thessalonian church that we read this morning. Remember last week when I said Jesus is coming, look busy? We treat it like it's a threat instead of a promise that Christ is returning. Christ isn't returning to condemn us. Christ is returning to make us all new. Look at what the last part of Thessalonians, beginning at verse 9, says. 
For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up as indeed you are doing. That's the key to understanding this passage. We are called to encourage one another. We encourage one another physically through gifts like these Thanksgiving dinner bags or those shoe boxes. Those are physical, tangible ways, but there are so many other ways to encourage one another. I can't tell you the number of cards my mother has received since my dad died from members of this congregation and other congregations I've served as well who have reached out to her, who call her on a regular basis. There are others in the congregation who are grieving and you have surrounded them with your love and your kindness and your care. We have a youth group here that we continue to reach out to even though they're so burned out with being on Zoom calls. We have folks in the congregation who are struggling in ways that I can't share with you because they've been shared with me as pastoral confidence. But this isn't one or two folks. This is a lot of people in our congregations who are wrestling with financial issues or other problems in their lives because of COVID or even beyond COVID. We have people who are suffering from despair over the situation we're in right now. We are called to encourage one another with words of hope and peace, with words of grace, with forgiving love, with letting go of grudges. My golly, if I could do anything, if I had a magic wand, I'd wave it over all you and get rid of your grudges because grudges are killing the church not Epworth, the church in general, because people dig in and they will not budge. And there is nothing that buries God's grace more than that. Not an easy passage to preach. It's nice if we could just say it's about money, isn't it? Give, 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 give. It's nice if we could say give your time, give your talents to the church. And those things are important. But if you would invest the grace that God has invested in you in the world, you would see changes. Now, I preached this passage so many times through the years, and one of the times I did it, we were on our way to Jamaica on a mission trip. So I decided to see what we would do if we did it just purely as finance. And out of my own pocketbook, not out of church finances, I handed out money in the church one day. I handed out a $100 bill, a $50 bill, and a $20 bill. And as a thief in the night, I didn't tell them until the week before, this is the week you need to come back and tell us what you've made. Well, and it sort of just played out like the parable. The one who made 20 said I was embarrassed. I forgot all about it, so I just, I did give a little bit more. The one who had made $20 invested in the business that she ran, she was a Mary Kay consultant, and she returned four or $500. The one who got the $100 bill came in with over $1,000. I was like, what did you do? He was a professional firefighter in Montgomery County, Maryland. And he bought potato chips at Sam's Club. And he put them in all the fire stations, the professional fire stations in Montgomery County with a sign that said, my church is sending a mission trip to Jamaica. If you buy some chips, we'd get there faster. People said, you're crazy. You know what's going to happen, don't you? They're just going to take your potato chips and run. There was something about that word church on there that made people put money in. They put money in and he bought more chips and more chips and more chips and more chips. But you know what? It wasn't about the chips or the money. What happened because he put that sign there, people started coming to him and saying, I need you to pray with me. I didn't know you were a Christian. I need you to hold me in prayer. And then one guy came to him and said, you go to Trinity United Methodist Church in Frederick, Maryland? You have vans, don't you? And he said, yes, we have vans. And he said, my kid was on a whitewater rafting trip with the youth group. Their van broke down, and your church came and rescued them, and he gave him $100 then and there. And then when we went to Jamaica, I said to him, you want to go on the trip? And he said, I don't have any skills for carpentry. He said, I can put out a fire. That's about it. But we got there. We had their blueprints. We had all the work orders. We had everything we needed. They didn't know we were coming. There had been a breakdown in communications within the mission organization that sent us there. We ended up working in an orphanage. And Dean, the man who made all the money, who went on the trip with us thinking he wasn't going to have much to offer, was the father of five children mm -hmm. under the age of 10. He was the most valuable person on the team. As little children, 
came running to us and crawled up on us and wanted to be held, and he could feed five kids at a time without blinking an eye. Because he invested himself in the trip because it was a way to communicate God's love in Jesus Christ. He was an encourager to the rest of us. That's what we're called to do, to encourage one another, which begins by recognizing the grace that God has shown to us, recognizing that our own sins have been forgiven. They are not what prevented us from getting to God because of Christ's love for us. It's not about living a life of lawless purity or lawful purity It's not about being able to say we've done it all right the way God asks us. It's not about being better than anybody else. It's about acknowledging that before God, we're all in a big mess without our Savior. I don't know about you, but I need a Savior. Because without Christ, I do not know where my life would be. We have been blessed with abundance. Even the one who received the least received more than he could ever hope to need or have in a lifetime of work. That's how much Jesus Christ loves you and loves me. So what are you going to do with it? Are you going to bury it in the yard? Or are you going to take it into the world and spread it around? One of my favorite lines from Thornton Wilder's play, The Matchmaker, which was made into a musical, most of you know, Hello, Dolly. When she quotes her late husband, Ephraim, she says, Ephraim always said, money's like manure. It's not good for anything, so you spread it around to help little things to grow. Grace, I'm not going to say grace is like manure, but grace will return abundantly if you're not afraid to show it and use it and proclaim it in the world. I know that's possible because I know Epworth is a very talented congregation. Thanks be to God. Amen.